My name is Alex Binder, and I'm a member of the Student Environmental Action Coalition at UNH, and have been one of the organizers for the event. Um, last February, about 30 UNH students, including members of the Student Environmental Action Coalition, traveled to Washington, D.C. for the Forward on Climate Rally to show our opposition to the proposed Keystone XL pipeline. What made this oil pipeline stick out from the rest was the type of oil it was going to be carrying. Tar sands are made up of a naturally occurring mixture of clay, sand, water, and dense ex and extremely viscous bitumen. The bitumen can be refined into synthetic crude oil and is the new black gold for which oil companies desire at whatever the environmental and human costs. However, tar sands only contain about 10% bitumen. So with the devastating and extremely destructive extraction processes to gather tar sands, only 10% of what is mined and dug up is actually needed. Canadian authorities have referred to bitumen as a thick, sticky form of hydrocarbon, so heavy and viscous that it, will not, that it will not flow unless heated or diluted with lighter hydrocarbons. At room temperature, it is much like cold molasses. That is why in the summer of 2010, when one million gallons of tar sands oil poured into the Kalamazoo River in Michigan from an Enbridge Inc. pipeline, the majority of the bit bitumen sunk to the bottom of the river. Although nearly $1 billion have been spent over the past three years to clean up the spill, almost 40 miles of the river are still contaminated. Because there is no real way to clean up tar sand spills, and because of the hazardous pollution produced from the excavation and refining processes, which have destroyed and endangered ecosystems surrounding communities and thousands of human lives, there is no doubt that tar sands are a bad idea. So when the Student Environmental Action Coalition found out that Enbridge Inc. and the Portland Pipeline Corporation were considering reversing the flow of the Portland-Montreal Pipeline, which runs through states in New England, including New Hampshire, to pump tar sands from Canada to Portland, Maine for exporting, we knew that we needed to take action. So we are so thankful that 350 Maine, NRDC, and 350.org put this Tar Sands Exposed tour together to spread awareness and to educate the public on this dire issue. At the end of the evening, we asked that Durham Town residents come to our table, which is right over here, to sign a Durham Town resolution. And we asked that UNH students come to our table as well to sign a UNH Student Senate resolution. These steps taken will only better ensure our goal towards a Tar Sands Free New Hampshire. And of course, these local steps especially if done in every town in the state, will resonate and sound the bell for necessary change. There are hundreds of thousands of people forced to live in poor health conditions due to big oil companies, from frontline communities in Texas to Canada. So tonight we stand in solidarity with them all, allowing, with all of them, because allowing these oil companies to destroy lives and livelihoods is unacceptable. So now I would like to introduce two 350 main coordinators, sure. <laughs> Sarah Lachance and Bob Klotz. Thanks so much for coming out. We are on stop number five, so I guess we're at the halfway point of this tour that we created, and it's really fabulous to be looking out here at almost a completely full auditorium. Uh, I just want to give you a little bit of background about why we decided to create this tour. Uh, for lots of us here tonight and throughout the tour, we're sitting around our kitchen tables now, and we're reading in the paper about the Portland-Montreal pipeline. The issue of tar sands has arrived where we are suddenly aware of it here in New England. But we often talk about it in the context of a coming threat. What will happen if this pipeline gets reversed and tar sands is carried through this old pipeline and it bursts like it has in Kalamazoo or Mayflower? And we were all thinking at 350 Maine that it's wonderful that that dialogue and conversation is happening, but the word threat doesn't really fit because it's not a threat up in Alberta, Canada. It's a reality. It's a very dire, horrible reality that the frontline communities, the First Nation people of that area are having to put up with as they have their treaty rights broken and their people become sick 
and their land become poisoned and their hunting grounds polluted. So that needs to be an important part of the conversation that we're all having, that we're all standing up against. Uh, also here in New England, we have a new threat that's coming uh, to the area. Since it's a campus, I hope you all don't mind that you all got some homework. You got that nice binder, and in that there's all kinds of great information. One of them includes that new threat, where a recent report came out from the NRDC in Washington, D.C., that speaks to the fact that right now there isn't tar sands oil in our fuel supply, but it's coming if we don't stand up and take action. So there is a huge um, consortium of environmental groups that are all coming together to speak to that issue, to talk about how we're going to keep tar sands oil out of our fuel supply. So I urge you to read about that and learn more about it. We're actually going to take action on it today. We're going to, I'm going to pass around this petition for us all to sign. Those of you that are New Hampshire residents, it's asking your governor to uh, keep tar sands out of the fuel supply. You also have more homework in your um, folder, a postcard for uh, President Obama to ask him to please not approve the Keystone Pipeline. So. Um, those are a couple of quick logistics. Um, I also, just knowing that it's Crystal's last night here, uh, I need to just speak to what this has meant to me to have these speakers come here. Um, you know, vision, envisioning what this was gonna be like and um, listening to their stories and getting us all um, motivated to take action and stand into solidarity was obviously our goal, but I had no idea um, just how motivating and how inspiring their stories were going to be. It's a real honor to be working with Crystal Lehman and with Ariel Deranger and with Garth Lem's room of peers. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm just uh, in awe with your strength and your courage. And I hope that I will continue to have the courage that you have shared with me to go forward with this battle with you. And now I want to introduce you to Bob Klotz, who is uh, one of the founders of 350 Maine and my mentor. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I echo the honor. I, I've just uh, gotten to be part of the tour the last couple of days in terms of on the road. And it's an enormous amount of work and an enormous amount of fun. And I really want to honor, in particular, Sarah, who was the, the inspiration for this whole idea, this whole crazy nine-stop idea across the Northeast. So. If we could give uh, Sarah a round of applause. For um, but it has been really incredible grassroots networking uh, opportunities and challenges. And we, we were going to get right into the program, but just a couple of housekeeping things. As you came in the door, hopefully you got the, the binder of information, and there will be more available at the end. Uh, 350 New Hampshire, which has supported us tremendously, has some material available on that uh, diagonal table, and we have some t-shirts and bumper stickers, and happy to chat about 350 Maine. The students have their table, as you know, and Garth has a number of his prints that he can speak to more, uh, you know, that you can look at and uh, are available for purchase. Um, with our 350 activity, just to say it, we, we can take cash, and we have that fancy little swipe thing if you want to do the credit card piece, but one of our main activities with this has to been to be doing fundraising in support of the legal defense uh, activities of these First Nations, and they'll speak to that in more detail. Um, but there's two opportunities uh, to contribute to that, and one is uh, for a raffle, which I'm going to let Sarah explain the mechanics around, for one of uh, Garth's prints that he has donated. Uh, the copy you'll receive is out front there, and we're just, this is the same image, basically. But you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, all you have to do at the end, and I um, very much urge you to participate in the raffle and make a donation, is just come down to this table. I'll be there, and so will other friendly faces, and uh, you can get a ticket there and make a donation. We're asking for a suggested donation of $10 or more, and if you stick around, we're going to uh, also draw the raffle after the event. And also, if you stick around, and we'd really appreciate it, we'll quickly at the end, we have a banner that's been going from tour stop to tour stop, and we'll have photographers back here shooting up into the audience, and if people can just stand up, and uh, that, that'll be the... Uh, the official wrap up. We're doing a question and answer period in this one. Yes. Yeah. So I think so. Each speaker will speak for 20 minutes, and then there will be a question and answer for the entire group at the <coughs> end. And uh, sorry, we didn't have enough popcorn for tonight, but uh, we're glad you're here. It's a wonderful theater. We and did. yeah, I have one more thing, and because I, I am so busy, crazy having this nine-stop tour, I forgot to thank the Student Environmental Action Coalition 
so much for putting us on. Uh, it's been amazing to work with you, and I, I just think you put on a wonderful event, as well as the support of 350 New Hampshire and the um, New Hampshire Audubon Society. So thank you. The first speaker is Garth Lenz, an international award-winning photojournalist. Um, if we could get the lights right down, that would be uh, that would be great. Um, I'm just going to get right started. Is, is this too loud? No. Okay. Um, anyways, I have to uh, move fairly quickly here. I'm going to try to get a 35-minute presentation down to uh, to about almost half that time. So, um, oftentimes I feel that in these uh, these talks we focus too much on what divides us instead of what unites us. And so I'd like to start with a few images from around the world, from some of the places that I've been so fortunate to visit. And I'm wondering why this is not advancing as it should. Uh, please work. Okay. This should work. It's not working. This is really not what you need to have happen. Um, hang on, folks. Parts of the world that I've been hearing. What's that? No, I want the dark. Thanks. Like a man. Um, we oftentimes focus on what divides us instead of what connects us. And what connects us is this incredible home, Turtle Island, planet Earth, that we all depend on, that nurtures and supports us and provides everything that we have and that we need. And we need to all be together on this. Because whether you're Democrat, Republican, Conservative, Liberal, NDP, Green Party, you're part of the problem and you're part of the solution. The people that work in this industry are good working people. They sometimes, I feel like they feel vilified and, and you know, they're salt of the earth folks trying to provide for their families the best way they can, creating a product that we are the market for. So I think we need to think beyond those divisions and work together. And I feel like our leaders of all political stripes on both sides of this border have really failed us. I feel like they, more than the oil companies, more than anybody, are the ones that we depend on to ensure that these things are done in a proper way. And as I think about this wonderful planet we live on, I, I think of the boreal forests of Canada, the largest and most intact forest ecosystem in the entire world. It's a remarkable place. And I like to talk about that because this, of course, is the ecosystem which supports the First Nations people, some of whom are going to be speaking to you tonight, and is the home of the tar sands. In Canada, it stretches from beginning in the east to the Labrador Sea, and this is the home of the George River caribou herd, the largest remaining wild caribou herd in the world. All across this ecosystem, the boreal forest, we have an incredible abundance of wetlands. Now, globally, wetlands are one of the most threatened ecosystems in the world. They're incredibly critical and, and they're in abundance all across Canada's north. They filter water, they purify air, and they're one of the greatest carbon sinks we have in the world. They're also incredibly beautiful. And they're also the, the nesting ground, the breeding ground for almost half of the 800 bird species that we find in North America. And these species from as far south as the Gulf of Mexico, like the American white pelican, migrate every year Canada's boreal to breed and nest and raise their young. The forests are incredibly beautiful. We're moving now onto Ontario, the north shore of Lake Superior, and this is where some of Canada's non-Aboriginal uh, greatest art exports, the group of seven painters from the 19th century, took much of their inspiration. So a very, very beautiful forest and a very an important link, obviously, to the First Nations, the First Peoples of this, of this area. <coughs> Uh, but also to us, uh, us uh, visitors from Europe. <coughs> now across uh, in Manitoba on the east side of the Poplar River, I'd like to stress the wonderful collaborations between First Nations and, and, and non-native people, between Canadians and Americans. And here in NRDC, along with the Poplar River First Nation, have worked very, very hard to protect the east side of Lake Winnipeg, hopefully very <coughs> soon with the UNESCO um, Cultural Reserve designation. As children in Canada, we all learn about these rivers in, in school. And that's because very, very famous rivers here in the north. Uh, these were the rivers that the first uh, non-indigenous explorers, the Europeans, the Courier de Bois, the, the, uh, the voyageurs, searching for a passage, a northwest passage to expand the fur trade, 
they wisely adopting the techniques of the First Nations using canoes, they explored these rivers, the Smoky, the Wapiti, the Peace, the Athabasca, and perhaps the most famous of all, the Mackenzie. So it's a very important historic link for Canada as well. Now, to the far north, the Boreal, or the Taiga, borders the tundra. And here, just a couple of hundred kilometers south of the Arctic Circle, is the wintering ground of the porcupine caribou herd. Now, most of you probably know the porcupine caribou herd in terms of Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Now, the breeding ground. Now, obviously, the wintering ground is very important, too. And this area also uh, is very, very rich in mineral and oil and gas development. And though while not imminently threatened, like Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, it also is not, it is not protected. Now to the west, the boreal meets the coast mountains, and just over those mountains is the greatest remaining coastal temperate rainforest, the Great Bear Rainforest, which is contiguous with the Tongass National Forest. And a little later we'll talk with how that area so far from the tar sands is connected and threatened by them as well. All across the north we have this incredibly rich culture, the richest and most diverse culture in Canada, and that's of course the First Nations. Distinct cultures all across this area, many of these people still speak their, their traditional languages, know the dances, know the games, and I think this is because many of these areas are quite remote and the surrounding ecosystem is relatively intact. And I think that's very, very critical, and that's one of the reasons. And also the remoteness means that they are removed from some of the less positive benefits of our more southern non-native society. And I think this is very important because I think the First Nations people have an awful lot to teach us as we uh, face this ecological crisis. Because these people have lived collaboratively with, with, with nature for 10,000 years, using it using it to support themselves, but not destroying it. And I was, uh, had the great pleasure of traveling with a, uh, a Dene family on their annual moose hunt along the Liard River as it crisscrossed the Northwest Territories and Northern British Columbia. And when they took the moose, every part of that moose was used, from the nose to the large intestines. Inside the hooves, there's a kind of marrow that makes a natural sort of jello. And even the hoof bones are fashioned into a tool that can be used to skin future moose that are hunted. Now in the middle of this great ecosystem, trapped under the frozen forests and, and wetlands of northern Alberta, lies the Alberta tar sands, the very antithesis of all of these kinds of values I've been talking about. Now, this is the largest energy project in the history of the planet. These are the third largest oil reserves and the single largest supply of foreign oil for the United States. Our Prime Minister, Stephen Harper has said this is an undertaking of epic proportions, akin to the building of the Great Wall of China or the pyramids, only greater. And what is happening here is truly happening on a scale that I sometimes describe as, as biblical. Were I to stand beside, I just walk over, but were I to stand beside this truck, my head would come up to about, about here. And that truck is the largest such truck of its kind in the world. 400 ton capacity dump truck, 47 and a half feet long, 32 and a half feet wide, 25 feet tall. Within the dimensions of that truck, you could build a two-story, 3,000 square foot home. Now my family of four, we live in a 1,500 square foot home. So we could put two of our homes within the dimensions of that truck. So when you look at that truck, don't think of a truck, think of a 3,000 square foot home. And then think of that 3,000 square foot home lining up back and forth all through this. And this is one very, very small section of six very, very large mines. And ask yourself, what, what sort of a section, subdivision, or part of, of Durham might that be? Probably a pretty big chunk. Maybe the whole town, I don't know. Now we're going to step back a little bit from that same mine, seeing a much larger section, but still not the entire mine. In the back we have these sulfur piles here that are maybe 20 city blocks four stories high, the largest sulfur piles in the world. Uh, there's actually two others that you can't see. This is a byproduct of the refining process. And these trucks here, these uh, trucks slash 3,000 square foot homes, but in the back, these little lights you see, I had a little bit too much coffee today, um, that are about a pixel in size, those also are those trucks, or as I'm asking you to say, 3,000 square foot homes. Now imagine those lined up 
all across here. Now, this is a massive, massive area, and this is one of six mines. <coughs> now, land lease approvals have already been signed that would ensure the footprint of those six mines grows at least by an order of 10. Well, that is a huge, huge area. Now, the other method by which the, uh, the bitumen, um, as our introductory speaker said, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Thank you very much for that wonderful description. Uh, the bitumen is, you know, you've heard this called oil sands, you've heard it called tar sands, neither term is correct, and bituminous sands, just, you know, it's too much of a mouthful. So this, this bitumen is like a toffee or tar-like substance. Now, the other way of getting it out of the ground is through this vast network of subterranean pipes. And this is called in situ or SAG-D, steam activated gravity drainage. By this method, chemically treated water and steam is superheated, pumped through this huge network, subterranean, about 400 feet deep. And what happens is that the upper pipe heats and liquefies the bitumen, it, 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 it drains down and then is pumped up through another pipe. Now, it may not look quite as bad as the mines, but is actually in some ways even more impactful in that it fragments a far larger area of the landscape. Studies by the Pemini Institute have shown over 10 years a reduction of 90% of key indicator species like woodland uh, caribou or, and uh, woodland caribou and grizzly bears. And uh, it, it uses at least as much energy and produces at least as much carbon in the processing of the oil. Now the oil by either method has been called by some the world's dirtiest oil. And this is because it is a very high carbon content oil. And this is the reason why the Alberta tar sands are Canada's single largest and fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions. They currently produce about the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions as some countries in Europe, such as Denmark. Now the other major issue is these huge tailings ponds. Here they are, and there's the Athabasca River and of course the incredible amount of water used by the tar sands. For each of the 1.8 million barrels of tar sands oil produced currently every single day now, anywhere from two to four barrels of water is used. It's laced with some of the most toxic chemicals known to humanity and dumped back out in these tailings ponds. To give you an idea of the sheer volume that's being pumped every single day, just one of these companies pumps into one of its tailings ponds 250,000 tons of this toxic sludge every 24 hours. Natural Resources Canada, about six or seven years ago, calculated that to that point, enough toxic sludge had been produced to fill a canal 65 feet wide by 35 feet deep that could stretch all the way from Fort McMurray to Edmonton and on to, Al uh, on to Ottawa, a distance of about 2,000 miles, and I think it's kind of suitable that that terminus might go to Ottawa because that's where a lot of the decisions are being made that's allowing this to continue. Now, that toxic sludge is dumped into these tailings ponds. These are the largest toxic impoundments in the world. They can be seen from outer space. There are currently 19 of them which line either side of the Athabasca River, and they range in size up to 9,000 acres. That's two-thirds the size of the entire island of Manhattan. And once again, if you look at these, uh, these trucks here, and imagine these as 3,000 square foot homes and line them back and forth, and this is not one of the larger tailing spawns, by the way, you get an idea of just what a huge area this is. Now, water testing has shown that these toxins are showing up in communities, communities which rely on this food. And I've been lent boats by First Nations folks and warned not to take the fish, not to eat the food, and yet find that very thing, three or four fish on their porch to feed their family. And that's because the cost of food is so exorbitant in these communities that these people feel they have no choice but to feed their children this toxic food in order to survive. And as a parent of two young children, I cannot imagine what that does to your soul to be put in that position. And I think what an absolute crime that in one of the richest countries in the world, where people are getting so rich from this resource, these neighboring communities are forced into this terrible position. This industry is surrounded by the boreal forest, which is the most effective terrestrial carbon sink in the world. Sequesters almost twice as much carbon as the 
tropical rainforests such as the Amazon, and is one of our best defenses against climate change. But in the creation of these mines, this boreal forest is scraped away, this terrestrial sink released into the atmosphere and replaced by perhaps the most carbon-intensive fossil fuel production that we currently have. And this is one of the reasons why Canada went from being a signatory to Kyoto to not only signing it away, but then trying to get other countries to abdicate their global responsibilities in terms of carbon reduction. And this is one of the reasons why every, every day at various conferences we get the fossil fuel award of the day, whether it's Cancun, Dartford, or Copenhagen. Now, 70 miles downstream from this industrial development lies the Athabasca Delta, the largest freshwater delta in the world, the only freshwater delta at the crossroads of all four migratory bird flyways, and as you would expect, absolutely critical habitat for the almost uh, 400 species that migrate every year to Canada's boreal to breed and raise their young. It is also the last refuge for the largest remaining herd of woodland bison, the largest terrestrial animal in North America. And it too is being impacted by the tailings ponds, by the tar sands, principally by the, the, um, the, the amount of water being used and by the leaching toxic burden of the tailings ponds. Now I mentioned um, here where we go over those mountains and we go from the boreal forest dry forest, relatively small trees, and then all of a sudden you go over those mountains, and I've hiked this with the Klingit people, their traditional grease trail, and then all of a sudden you hit that height of land, and you turn into this, you come into this ecosystem of warm, wet wind, 10 to 20 feet of rain, and these massive trees up to 20, uh, 30, 40 feet in, in uh, diameter, or in width, rather, in diameter, and up to maybe 300 feet tall. And this is the Great Bear Rainforest, perhaps the greatest concentration of some of the most iconic mammals in the world, such as grizzly bear and the salmon. And the salmon are the foundation for everything. They're the foundation for the bears, the wolves, the eagles. They're even the foundation for the forest. They actually did core sampling of the trees there, and they found salmon isotopes in the trees. And so many people refer to this as the salmon forest. Now, Enbridge, pipeline company that you're all unfortunately familiar with through Kalamazoo is, uh, is telling us that they can safely build an 800 mile pipeline across some of the remote, most remote area of northern Alberta and British Columbia over the northern Rockies across hundreds of salmon streams. And this is an area uh, which is so precious. Uh, Enbridge averages a pipeline spill every single week. You don't hear about them. You hear about the Kalamazoo and a few others, but that is a fact. And if that happens, it will mean the end to all of these species and the people that depend on this, on this particular species, the salmon and on the ecosystem. And it's a critical part of both the economy and culture of both the inland First Nations and the coastal First Nations. Now, when that bitumen reaches the port of Kinemat on the west coast in the heart of the Great Bear Rainforest, just south of the Tongass, it will be loaded onto tankers the size of the Empire State Building, far larger than the Exxon Valdez, and it will go through Douglas Channel, one of the most difficult to navigate waterways in the entire world. First Nations know too that it is not a question of when, uh, not a question of if, but a question of when one of these tankers goes down. And at that time we will forget all about the Exxon Valdez because this toxic spill will spread all the way from Alaska down to the north coast of Oregon. And this is why they are unanimously, uh, unanimously opposed to this development. And of course, here you have the, in green, the proposed Keystone XL pipeline, which is not going to provide you with any kind of energy security. It is not a pipeline to the United States. It is a pipeline through the United States and through your agricultural breadbasket so that our oil companies can have a greater profit and get that oil more effectively to foreign markets, not the United States. And here, most terrifying, we have the network of pipelines that is designed to triple production, and this includes the pipelines that the local activists will be talking about here, and get production from about 1.8 million barrels per day to perhaps as high as 5 or 6 or even 7 million barrels per day. And in the process of doing that, Natural Resources Canada 
their words, not mine, claims this will industrialize an area greater than the size of Florida. Now, James Hansen has done the calculation and said that the combination of that as well as the clearing of the carbon sequestering boreal forest and replacing it with this massive high intensity carbon production will be game over for the stabilization of our climate. So what are we to do? You know, it's not just about tar sands. It's obviously tar sands is, is incredibly uh, critical. But we're all so dependent on fossil fuels. And, and regardless of our best intentions, the whole structure of our society is built around fossil fuels. Our, our cities are temples to our fossil fuel consumption. We have to break free of that. I mean, we have to take small steps. We have to do things, it could be anything from, you know, at your university making sure that there's a, a more, more racks so people can take their bikes to school or at your place of employment so there's showers so people can uh, bicycle and, and still uh, not stink up the office. <laughs> uh, we need to make our cities more pedestrian friendly and we need to look at kind of big picture things like where we get our agriculture from. <coughs> And we're going to continue to use energy, and, and for the foreseeable future, we're going to continue to use fossil fuels as well. But we need to start the transition to more sustainable forms of energy. And I know that wind energy is a big issue in this part of the country. And I'm not saying that all these you know, so-called green energy projects are great things or not. They all have a footprint. None of them are great for the environment. But we need to choose what's going to be less impactful. And, and please note, this is uh, wind turbines on agricultural land, so it is already an industrialized landscape. And this also is in Alberta, so Alberta's doing some good things as well. When I was a kid, my dad told me about the tar sands, and he said, you know, we have these incredible oil reserves in northern Alberta, but we can't get to them. We don't have the technology, it's too expensive, there's no market. And it sounds to me a lot what people say when we talk about solar, tidal, wind power, people using those same same excuses. And yet, what, what did industry and government do? They invested billions of dollars into the tar sands to make them viable. Well, we need to start doing that with these more positive forms of energy that can fuel our future as well. But I think what we can all agree on is that the answer is not more tar mines. We don't need more pipelines to tie us more and more to a fossil fuel future. And we can't allow things like the tailings ponds to grow and multiply and to continue to threaten surrounding communities. We need to understand that clean water is always going to be worth more than dirty oil. That the forests of our world, the boreal forests, the temperate rainforests, the tropical rainforests are the lungs of the planet and we need to preserve them. They're our best friends in our fight against climate change. And we need to do all of these things for First Nations, for First Nations children, but for all of us. Because climate change doesn't need a passport. And pollution and toxins don't respect borders. I'm a father. I have two adorable young children that are my life. And, you know, we spend a lot of time, I think as, as parents, we, our, our primary goal is to keep our children safe. And we worry a lot about the boogeyman in the bushes. But every day in our actions, we are doing a, a lot of things that could jeopardize their future. Because the greatest threat to their future is not that boogeyman in the bushes. I, I think it's turning our planet into something that looks like this. And so as a parent, I think if I'm going to bring life into this world, my greatest responsibility is to do everything I can to ensure that they have a healthy, clean future to thrive in and for their children as well. And that's why I want to do everything I can to tell my children when they're grown up that I worked hard so that their future would not look like this, but that would hopefully look like this. Thank you very much. It's actually Ariel Sekwe Duranger. Um, my name, Ariel Sekwe, is a Dene name, and I am a Dene Sutlene woman from the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation. Um, and so there's the proper pronunciation. So, um, Garth 
show some really great depictions of what the tar sands are, what they represent, um, and I'm hoping to give you a little bit of an, an understanding of who they're impacting. Because we can see the environmental implications very, very easily through pictures, but understanding the, the human implications is sometimes not as easy to understand. And even more complex is understanding the treaty rights implications in Canada. Because First Nations in Canada have unique rights. And our rights are enshrined in the Canadian Constitution. So First Nations in Canada, not all of them, but many of them sign treaty with the Crown. So ACFN is one of those nations. I'm not sure which one of these I'm supposed to use. I, I had to advance from the computer. I, I could never figure out the remote. Yeah. There's three of them. <laughs> <laughs> so understanding who the ACFN or the Athabasca Chippewa First Nation really is, is really intrinsic into understanding the impacts that this industry is really having on us. One of our former chiefs, said that the land is the essence of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation culture, values, and spirituality. That still rings true today because our people are largely land users. And as Garth had pointed out, our people go out on the land. And when we go out on the land, we don't just go out for recreational purposes. This is a part of our cultural procurement, a part of our culture, and essentially who we are as people. The Athabasca Chippewan First Nation has created a mission and a vision. And it's very, very simple. The Athabasca Chippewan First Nation wants to be a proud, culturally unified, and independent First Nation. And we want to foster growth and progress for our members by providing and maintaining opportunities with respect for land, water, and culture. Because without land, water, and culture, we are nothing. Many people have places of identity, places that they identify with. I'm Irish. My ancestors are from Ireland. I'm Scottish. My ancestors are from Scotland. For the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, we are Athabasca Chippewan, and we are from the Athabasca. If you completely remove that area, if you kill the land, the waterways, and, and uh, the air and the culture of that, those people, you essentially kill those people. And that, in fact, is the definition of genocide. So as I stated earlier, the First Nations of Canada are unique because we've signed treaties with the Crown or with the government. The Athabasca Chippewa First Nation signed Treaty No. 8. This treaty guaranteed to our people the right to access our traditional territory to continue practicing our cultural livelihoods. This included access to hunting, fishing, trapping, gathering, and cultural procurement areas for us to be able to use for as long as the sun shines and the rivers flow. That was further entrenched in the Canadian Constitution. Um, sorry. And so it's right there, I just said that. <laughs> uh, that was further entrenched in the Canadian Constitution in 1982, which was amended to include further protection of our treaty rights. And then the government also created this, this act called the Indian Act in Canada, which defines how we ensure what they call the Indian people are basically governed and regulated. And, you know, it's a really contentious thing, but one of the things that it does state in the Indian Act, the one good thing that it has, is that it says that we have to be consulted when um, there are projects or impacts to our treaty and Aboriginal rights in this country. So the Indian Act is a very contentious piece of legislation because it also put our people into residential schools. It also took away our ability to sell goods freely and own property in the country and all sorts of really bad things. But the one good thing about it is that it states that we have the right to be consulted and accommodated when projects impact our constitutional rights as entrenched in the Canadian Constitution in 1982. So understanding the ACFN with respect to tar sands, you have to understand where our traditional territory lies. Our traditional territory spans uh, within a very large part, this is pointer, right? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Nope. <laughs> no, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so this line right here where it kind of squares off, that's the border between Saskatchewan and Alberta. And so our lands aren't just in Alberta. They go into Saskatchewan. And, and my family is actually from the northern part, just below um, just below what's Lake Athabasca, which is the lake which you can't see quite clearly up there. Is that it? Yes, that's it. Um, I think it 
There, there oh, it is. So this is Lake Athabasca. Um, and my family actually owned, had a track line in this area. And the ACFN's traditional territory, which is this entire area, uh, is not just under threat from just tar sands. And this, again, this isn't about being anti-development and anti-tar sands. This is about looking at exactly what Garth was saying. We have to be thinking about energies. We have to think about moving forward in a way that's holistic and that not only respects the environment, but also respects the cultures and the peoples that rely on these, these environments, not just as recreational purposes, but as a part of who they are as, a pe as peoples. So again, we, are, are, we call ourselves the Kaital Dene, which means people of the land of the willow, and that's people of the river. And so we've occupied our traditional land since basically we say time memorial, government will say thousands of years. Uh, and we have sustained our people through hunting, fishing, and trapping on the lands, and that still continues to this day. Most people in the community of Fort Chippewan still rely heavily on the traditional food sources, as Garth had stated. And it, it is incredibly troubling. I live in the city of Edmonton. I choose to live in the city of Edmonton for one reason. I have children. What's incredibly sad is that I don't want to take them back to my traditional territory. Because I don't want them to be at risk to getting cancer. I don't want them to have to see the destruction to the homelands. It's very difficult for me because I want them to have that. But right now, the current industrial development of my people's territory is putting my family at risk. I have cousins, I have aunts, I have uncles that have died or become sick from the illnesses, from doing the very thing that we know how to do, that the Canadian government said that we would be able to do without, free, freely, without harm. And that was to be able to practice our cultural rights to hunting, fishing, trapping, gathering. And now in the Canadian Fort Chippewan, there are signs that say, if you're under the age of 12 or a pregnant woman, you should limit your fish consumption to one fish a month. This is in a community where fish is the central part of our diet. This is a staple diet that subsidizes the high cost of living. You can't tell those people not to feed their children fish because they can't feed their children otherwise. And yes, people will say, well, why don't they get jobs in the, in the industry, in the economy? But these people don't want to be a part of tearing up their homelands and their traditional territories. So it becomes this really, really hard place for our people to be in. For me, it's really hard because I want to be back there, but I can't. We are governed by what's called the Chief and Council System. And I, I'm incredibly lucky to have these people right here. Chief Alan Adam, Councillor Anthony Lattiser, Lorraine Hoffman and Greg Marcel and Scott Flett, who's not actually a monument, <laughs> but a person. He actually hates getting his picture taken. He's a pretty handsome man. Um, these, this leadership has done something incredibly brave. They have decided that enough is enough. That our people, our rights, and our culture cannot be the status quo uh, and the casualty in the pursuit of economic development in our traditional territory. And that the laws of, this, of our country and our treaty rights can no longer be the casualties to continue to move forward in irresponsible and out of control development in Alberta's tar sands. We are also governed by what is called an Elders Council. And our Elders Council was formed about 15 years ago. And they're really working very closely with our chief and council and something called an IRC, which is called an industry, Re industry, Resource, industry Relations Corporation. And what those are, are these, these bodies that are created to look at all the applications that come in from industry, review every single EIA and every single proposal to ensure that they don't infringe on our rights. And our chief and council, our elders council, and our IRC work together to try and find a strategy to assert our rights, to further protect our people, our culture, the animals, the waterways, and our entire being of who we are as Athabasca people from further annihilation and encroachment from these projects. 
how the, gal the, I the elders were really guiding our entire strategy. In 2010, they created a declaration. And the declaration is being used to respond to the Canadian government and the Alberta government's policies to allow concessions for industry to basically continue at will. So the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan, which I talk about right here, and the Public, public Lands Administration Regulation, and the Alberta Caribou Recovery Strategy are all these policies that the Alberta government was creating to create these optics that they were doing something to address the <coughs> environmental impacts in the region. But in actuality, what they did is they negated treaty and aboriginal rights and gave concessions to industry. The Lower Athabasca Regional Plan actually created an area in my community's traditional territory as a bitumen priority resource extraction zone. When we tried to fight it, they said it's in the public's interest. That policy has been passed. Our community is challenging it and has asked for a judicial review of that policy. This is the Elders' Declaration. I'm not going to go through it all. If you'd like a copy of our Elders' Declaration, um, I have copies and you can look at it. But basically what our elders have stated is that it's, we have to draw a line in the sand. ACFN has had enough with having our lands destroyed. No one is dealing with it, neither the federal nor the provincial crown. And yet you come to us constantly for approval of new projects. It is time for the government to stop cheating us of our rights to land use and livelihood, culture, and identity without proper consultation, mitigation, and compensation. So what they've done, exactly. And the reason why this is so bold and so important is that most of the other First Nations in the region feel as though they have no choice <coughs> to accept what's being given to them. Our communities are given basically handouts from industry. Industry comes into our communities, and there's about five communities in the Athabasca region. They come to the communities, and they come there with what my chief likes to call trinkets and baubles. They come there with iPads, and iPods, and Kobo readers, and all sorts of electronics, and they say, hey, we're gonna do a consultation process in your community. Come and be entered into this raffle. They come and they give a high-level presentation, basically outlining the EIA of their projects. They EIA. Environmental impact assessment of their projects. And they then pay certain people to come as well. They will be like, if you come as an elder of your community, we'll pay you $300 as an honorarium. So they get people to come. They, sign, they get everyone to sign in. They give away their trinkets and baubles, feed people lunch. They walk away and they go, check, consultation done. It's as simple as that. That is the process that our government has allowed to happen for the last 50 years in the Alberta tar sands. And our community has put our foot down and said, no more. And that is absolutely unique right now in, Al in Alberta's tar sands in the Athabasca region. And that's why this declaration and what our nation is doing is a really unique and courageous thing that our leadership and our elders council has taken on. So this is what we've done. I wish you could see this better, you can't really see it, but along this line right here, and all the way up here, we're calling this our protection zone. Currently in Alberta, this area down here, these are all projects that are currently in development. These yellow ones are proposed projects. These proposed projects would be in the areas that Garth had shown you pictures of, pristine boreal forests, wetlands. These are not the in situ, which the government tries to knock off as environmentally benign projects. These will be some of the largest open pit mines in Alberta. They will make the current mines projects look tiny in comparison. And this area is also not only critical to our people's tradition and culture and rights, but it is also the breeding grounds for wood bison, um, woodland caribou, migratory birds. It is also uh, the how home to the river system which feeds up into Lake Athabasca and into a UNESCO World Heritage Site. These are not just some simple areas that can be deemed bitumen priority use extraction zones. These areas are vital to the continuation of not only my people, but ecosystems that are vital to everyone on this planet. And this is what we're at odds for. This, this is Tarsus. This is what it looks like. This is raw bitumen pulled up from the ground. This is what everyone is fighting for in the region. This is what everyone thinks is, you know, is the new gold of our century. 
It's causing the industrialization of our traditional territory and has consequently affected the treaty promises and cultural and spiritual renewal, procurement of resources, and the Dene Sutlane people's connection and use of the landscape that is integral to our traditional use. This. This is simply all it is. I like this quote. There is nothing on this planet that compares with the destruction going on there. If there were a global prize for unsustainable development, the tar sands would be a clear winner. That was said by Dr. Schindler, who's an ecology professor at the University of Alberta, who recently just uh, joined myself, uh, Chief Adam, and Neil Young on a tour to spread awareness about what's happening in Alberta's tar sands and the treaty implications of these projects. He has done numerous studies that have proven that the tar sands are in fact poisoning waterways, fish, and air quality in the region, even though the government likes to cover them all up and say, oh, well, I don't know about his studies, our Dr. Schindler. Just to give you an idea of what the industry refers to as overburden. Overburden is our arboreal forests, it's our marshlands, it's, it's our land, it's, it's our culture. And since the operation of tar sands has begun, the, um, they have moved more than 1.4 billion tons of what industry likes to refer to as or overburden, which is arboreal forests. And it has moved more dirt than the Great Wall of China, the Suez Canal, the Great Pyramids of Cheops, and the 10 largest dams in the world combined. This is right now happening in the heart of my people's traditional territory. This is what keeps me from taking my children back home. The tailings ponds. The annual lights and oil sands withdrawals are equal to the city of 3 million. Industries use takes precedence over protecting fisheries and rivers. Right now, Alberta is trying to pass two new policies. Uh, the, um, the surface water quality and quantity framework, as well as the tailings management policies, which would allow government to continue withdrawing, or not government, would allow industry to continue withdrawing and dumping affluent back into the Athabasca River, river system. The water quality impacts are poorly understood because we have terrible monitoring in Alberta. Um, the current monitoring program, which is called the Joint Oil Sands Monitoring, which is supposed to be this multi-million dollar, world-class monitoring pro program, has recently um, led to all key four First Nations in the region pull out from that program because they have inadequate monitoring and they're doing nothing but looking out for the interests of industry rather than First Nations and environmental rights in the region. And the last fact, everyday tailings ponds leach over one million liters of toxic contaminant into the Athabasca River watershed and the Mackenzie River Basin, which is contributing to the contamination of our cultural foods, uh, fish, and wildlife. <coughs> The last piece that I want to touch on before I wrap up is, you know, one thing that industry will always say back to all of us is that, don't worry, we're going to put it all back. We have the technology and the know-how to reclaim the lands, and in fact, we are doing it right now. This is what it looks like, dense, lush biodiversity. This is what they call reclaimed. This is an actual reclamation site. <laughs> the quality of land that they are putting back into what they are calling reclaimed land is not something that a Dene Sulene or a Cree or any of the people, the traditional land users, would ever use. It would not be able to support the biodiversity that is necessary to continue practicing our treaty and Aboriginal rights in this country. Constitutionally entr entrenched rights, I might add. This is what they think that we're going to go back to. And in some cases, industry has said, oh, we've removed all the toxins. Now look at the land's great and clean now. That looks, again, I'll just show you before, yeah. after. <laughs> this is what they call equivalent new land use capacity. And to date, only 0.02% of all tar sands have, operations have been certified as reclaimed. This is less than a total of one square kilometer. <laughs> Migratory pattern disruptions, which Garb talked about. And these, all of these species are vital to the continuation of our treaty and Aboriginal rights. And the toxic contamination and cancers in the region is something that our community deals with every day. Our people are dying. You can't go into the community without finding someone who has an aunt or an uncle without cancer, or someone who's lost a loved one. The Alberta Health Services found that there was in fact a 30% increase of rare forms of cancer in the region 
leukemias and lymphomas were increased by three folds, bile duct cancers seven folds, and other t cancers in the soft tissue are, um, cancers were found elevated in women. We're seeing more and more breast cancer in the women in the community of Fort Chippewa. This is a town of 1,100 people. There have been six confirmed cases of a rare form of cancer that is linked directly to petrochemical contaminants in the water systems. And yet the government says, oh, there's no correlation. So what are we doing? First off, in 2011, we sued Shell. Our chief head up a, a, a case where we have sued Shell basically for failure to live up to the agreements that they promised to our nation to clean up, mitigate, and help our community develop a community-based community monitoring program. He stated that the fate of our communities and our rivers is at, the, is at stake and we are in the crosshairs of Shell's plans to aggressively expand tar sands in our traditional territory. We ask the public to support ACFN's effort, efforts and to stop Shell from permanently destroying our lands and community. In addition, we also launched a constitutional challenge based on Treaty 8 alleging that the provincial government and the energy giant Shell failed to adequately consult with us and that our rights would be violated if it were to go through. This was against the Jack Pine Mine project. However, the, even though the panel found significant adverse effects, they justified these effects and granted the approval under the Oil Sands Conservation Act. They said, oh, well, the Alberta government said that this area was a bitumen priority use area. Therefore, it's in the public's interest, even though your rights are going to be impacted and your lands are going to be destroyed. We are currently challenging. We have just filed for a... Um, a fiduciary review of that of that decision and we also have petitions available on avaz.com where we're asking the government to overturn their decision to approve this project. So we're going to continue to move forward in the face of all of this destruction, in the face of all of the adversity that we face, <coughs> face, I said that like five times, <laughs> ACFN will be continuing to apply pressure not just on Shell but on any of the projects that are opposing um, are proposing projects north of what we are calling the Firebag River, that line on the map. This includes projects by Tech, Coke, BP, Shell, you name it, those companies are in there wanting to propose projects. And we have made a decision that we will hold that line. And we will challenge any project that enters that territory. And we're not just doing it for our nation and our people, but we're doing it for the sake of humanity. Recently we partnered with Neil Young, and uh, this little meme came up. It says, Neil Young stands with them. Harper stands for this. Who do you stand with? And we really hope that that message rings clear because we don't, I don't want my children to have to grow up like that. I want them to continue to have what Garth showed in those pictures of the pristine boreal forest. And that's what my people are trying to preserve and protect. This seems really narcissistic, but I like the quote. <laughs> and I just want to end it with um, something that I said that someone captured at a conference. Um, it is, our people and our Mother Earth can no longer afford to be economic hostages <coughs> and race to industrialize our homelands. It's time for our people to rise up and take back our role as caretakers and stewards of the land. That message should ring through to all of us, because we all come from this earth. We are all creatures of Mother Earth. We have lost our way. My chief recently said that our people have been away from the land for so long that they have forgotten what it really is and what it really means. And it's time for us to reclaim who we are as humans and our roles in protecting our Mother, Mother Earth. Thank you. Merci, Chair. I'm a storyteller, so I, I, I tend to run away at the time. Um, that's it, and hello. Um, yeah, Crystal Lehman, I'm a member of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation, which is uh, located about two and a half hours northeast of uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Um, unlike you know, Ariel, you know, both, of our, uh, both of us you know, are First Nations women, but both come from uh, different treaty territories um, in Canada. Uh, there was 11 treaties that were signed across Canada, and, and I come from Treaty Number Six. Um, first off, I want to acknowledge um, the traditional territory that we stand on. Uh, 
of what is now known as um, New Hampshire, and it's the traditional territory of the Abenaki and the Penacook. Uh, Lakota chief and holy man Sitting Bull said this, for us warriors are not what you think of as warriors. The warrior is not someone who fights because no one has the right to take another's life. The warrior for us is one who sacrifices himself for the good of others. His task is to take care of the elderly, the defenseless, those who cannot provide for themselves, and above all, the children, the future of humanity. And that came from the militarization of Indian country by Winona Leduc. Mother Earth's soldiers are warriors because we believe in a better world, a better human existence, a better future for the generations to come. And we believe in the life-giving abilities of our one true mother. And the importance of raising the platform on the rights of Indigenous peoples is that we currently have the constitutional power to stop these extreme extractive industries from further raping and pillaging our lands. And the First Nations people of Canada, collectively, have the constitutional power to stop these developments. But we have the federal and the provincial governments who collaboratively have dismantled meaningful review and regulation of tar sands operations, which contribute to the cumulative impacts of this industry as a whole. And currently, tar sands, as an extreme energy, is the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. And from this greed, we have experienced things like the Conservative government passing Bill C-38, which gutted our environmental laws, took the protection of our mother and dismantled it. Bill C-45, a First Nations land grab and the complete ignorance of the 1% of the fresh water in the world, and that 80% of that is in Canada. And who gave this government the right to destroy our fresh water system and with barely a nod to the question of what we're going to drink when disaster strikes, because it will. If we continue to go the way that we are, and when it does, it's not going to know race, color, or creed. And they've done this with barely a nod to that. And then we back up to December 2012, where prior to passing Bill C-45 on one day, we had two and a half million protected lakes and rivers in Canada. And the day after the passing of Bill C-45, we were left with 97 protected lakes and 62 protected rivers in the name of industry. Which was then followed by the Alberta Provincial Bill S-8, which was, which was the privatization of our water. Taking the milk of our mother and turning it into a commodity. A government's attempt at trying to sell what was never theirs in the first place. And who can afford that? The poor First Nations people living in third world living conditions in a first world country? The poor farmer struggling to feed his family? The 99%? Industry, that's who can afford it. And our government made sure of that. And then our government pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol, then they signed FIPA with China, yet more behind the scenes closed door decisions, deliberately ignoring the democratic process of involving the citizen members of that nation we call Canada. And so here we sit, a government refusing to accept responsibility and hiding from accountability and transparency. And I don't know if that's clear enough for you, but looking beyond these borders, that we see, this is no longer an Indian problem. If you breathe air and you drink water, this is about you. There is one thing that connects each and every human being in this world. without looking at race, color, or creed, and that's water. We are involved in the direct exploitation of our natural resources from one end of that country to the other, all over this what we call Turtle Island. An industry, they talk so highly 
of reclamation. And you saw what they think reclamation is. And I'm going to share a story with you because like I said, I'm a storyteller. I was raised by my grandmother. You know, and I like to think that I'm lucky that I was raised by her. But in, in that area where those deposit, those, those uh, open pit mining, where it's happening there, where the Syncrude and the Suncor sites are, you can see across the road barren land. And then across on this side is a tailings pond. And then right beside there is a reclamation site. First of all, I don't even know how all three of those go together. But according to them, that, that they're reclaiming the land. They're going to return the land back to the Indians. So further to that, to even prove how much greater they are, they put some buffalo there. In a fence, like that makes us feel any better. And then industry with their lying words came along and said, you know, look, look how wonderful we are. We even put buffalo here. Look, they're, they're fine. They're roaming free in their natural habitat. We're even, we're even going to sacrifice some of those buffalo and feed it to the local elders. The elders, those ones who know more than we'll ever know who knew about this destruction long before we knew it was such. Those elders that talk about those prophecies of that black snake that's going to come over our Turtle Island, that prophecy that is here now, those pipelines, those ones, they took that need. Oh, thank you. You know, move along. You're awesome. And instead of consuming that meat, the elders got it tested. And the results were catastrophic. Chemicals so dangerous and so high in the meat content that it was deemed unfit for human consumption. And then in my area, where the in situ, the SAG-D, the CSS processes are taking place, we are seeing those effects as well. Our old people, they talk about our medicines. Through our oral history, they talk about those medicines that in their purest form at one time combined things like what we call muscae tea. I think the English term is, is um, Labrador tea, wild mint, rat root, what we call it, wikis, a natural acetaminophen, the cure-all, that's what the old people call this. In its purest form combined, they said could cure cancer. Those are the stories they talk about. Areas where our old people, they know where to go and pick these medicines. The thing with these, it grows in the water by the cattails. As it moves away, it has a spirit. That's what we believe. And it will move away if the water or the land is dirty. You're not finding this in the areas that we go and pick normally. And I've seen it with my own eyes. Reclamation for me is not poison wildlife, poison land, poison water. Am I have to have to use the clicker or what I have to do with me? All of a sudden I don't know what I'm doing. Huh. There we go. Okay, I guess you guys don't need to know what the uh, parts are. I'm gonna go there now. <clears throat> so where I come from, treaty number six. Was signed in eighteen seventy six. A nation-to-nation -nation agreement with the British Crown. And that agreement that we signed, you know, for, for the British Crown and those treaty signatories that came, when our visitors came over here, they wanted to settle the land. And our people, the Cree people that I come from, 
We didn't understand this concept that they wanted to own the land. Our visitors wanted to own the land. Because in our language, literally, there is no such thing as ownership of land. Because for us, when we talk about land and we literally translate it into the English language, it means to own your mother. That one that gives you life. That one that nurtures you. You cannot own your mother. But we said we will share this land with you in peace and friendship. And in exchange, we will show you how to live on our land, this land here, this Mother Earth. But you will accommodate us. And that as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the rivers flow, we will always have an inherent right to the land. We will always be able to go to the land to hunt, fish, trap, and forage, just as if we had never signed treaty. And we will be able to go to the land that same way as we did yesterday. We will be able to do that tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. And we made those agreements when they talk about those, that thing, that concept, treaty cannot be broken. For us, when we talk about that, what we mean for the British Crown, the agreement, a binding agreement to them was to sign your name on a piece of paper. For us, we made those agreements over those peace pipes, those treaty pipes. We filled those stems together. And those agreements were made over top of that. And that smoke, those promises were put there and carried to the Creator. A promise they made to their God and a promise we made to our Creator. You cannot break those. That is unbreakable. This is the traditional hunting territory of the Beaver Lake Cree. And the black border that you see there is the Alberta and the Saskatchewan border. Treaty 8 is just above us there. This treaty territory is also the territory of treaty number 6. But we cannot represent the other 49 nations that are a part of treaty number 6. We represent who we are. And that treaty territory spans about 23,612 square miles. 21,126 square miles of that has been illegally leased out to every major oil and gas company in the world. Without the federal government following through with due process and their duty to consult the Beaver Lake Creek. We are also protected by international law, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and our right to free prior and informed consent. And I can tell you right now, my community did not agree to that. You can see the southern portion of the Athabasca tar sands deposit, and then, or rather the, the northern, the southern, and then the northern portion of the Gold <coughs> Lake tar sands deposit that fall within the Beaver Lake Cree's traditional territory. And then the, the land reserved for Indians, our reservation, is located, I'd say where it says 140,000 square kilometers, we're located like where the two is. But don't get it twisted. The white portion is not land that's untouched. We also have natural gas extraction. And those fences are everywhere. The signs are everywhere. They're all over our reserve. One well site equals one hectare of habitat loss. And here's some images of seismic lines, which happens in the SAG-D process. 
And here is one very, very small, small portion of the Exxon Mobil site on the Cold Lake Tar Sands Deposit area. What you're seeing there, those white lines, that interweaving of white lines is above ground piping. Thousands and thousands of kilometers of above ground piping interweaving all over these extraction sites. And the animals will not cross over those. It's foreign to them. They will not cross over the seismic lines. They cannot escape their predators. The caribou being an example, an animal that we subsisted on, an animal that used to be in the thousands. Now, to this date, we are at between 175 and 275 woodland caribou in our traditional hunting territory. It is an animal that has been listed under the Species at Risk Act. And so therefore, this government and this industry, they have an obligation to protect that species. But before any of this discussion took place, if industry or government acknowledged that it was because of development, then they would have acknowledged that there has been a treaty right violation. So what they did in response to the species at risk was they came along and their solution to the whole problem was, well, we'll kill off the wolves. 5% of the wolves' diet is caribou. We'll kill the wolves. Of course that didn't fly with us. So then they came back and made it even better and said to the First Nations people, well, we'll put them in a fence until they can repopulate themselves. <coughs> well, yeah, that makes it even better. And then what happens when these herds start repopulating each other? Fantastic idea. <clears throat> I didn't come here to sell you anything. There's one thing that we have that industry and government will never have. And that's the truth. And the truth of the matter is, is that our babies are being airlifted to the university hospital for drinking contaminated water. The truth of the matter is, is that it's not uncommon for us to get a knock on the door by the man who delivers our water and he hands us a piece of paper from Health Canada a boil water advisory. Boil your water before you drink it. That's our reality. And that's the thing about this whole thing. <coughs> this isn't a tour. This isn't a show. These aren't stories. This is our reality. In one of the most powerful nations in this world, the original peoples of that land are facing this reality. Cancers, respiratory illnesses, moose with pus bubbles under the skin, deer with green meat. And like in Ariel's community, fish with tumors, that's a reality. And it should never be okay that you have to choose your indigenous ways of knowing and being over feeding your family. Because unfortunately today, our children have to eat.
And every once in a while, two minutes, I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm going to go over it. <laughs> um, you know, <clears throat> as women, we're the keepers of the water. That's what we believe in the, in the Cree culture. Because it's not by chance as women, we carry life in water. We nurture life, just like our mother, who gives us life. And so it's my obligation as a mother. I brought life into this world selfishly. And every once in a while, I, I, I try to acknowledge who I am as a nehe or squill, a free woman. And I go to that water on my nation and I put tobacco down to remind myself an offering to those beings that cannot speak for themselves. And I was sitting there last summer and I looked down at my feet. Pardon me, but this is really what I said. I, I looked down at my feet and I looked and I, you know, I'm 31 years old. I don't think that's very old. And I said, Holy shit, Crystal. That's where your, where your feet are. That's where the water line was when you were a child. What the hell is happening to the water? And then, two years ago, on August 4th, we had the fourth healing walk. Or the third healing walk, sorry up in the, the open pit mining sites in Fort McMurray. And it was my son's golden birthday. And I thought, you know, I kept them away from rallies and protests and things like that because I didn't want to expose them to things like that. But I took them there because I thought, you know, this is a time for healing the healing of our mother and we were going through a hard time too and I thought this is the time and I took my children up there and we went on this walk and about halfway through my son got a bleeding nose and then my 14 year old niece she had an asthma attack and to this day I still carry that guilt for taking them over there, thinking I was doing something good for my, for my kids. And then I question, is this what our future looks like? Are old people talking about how the fish don't taste good anymore? When they talk about that time when they could go to the land and they could skim the top of the water, they could take the dipper from their backpack and they could drink. And that was the best kind of water that they could ever drink. To this day, we cannot do that. This here is another example of what the in situ, this safe way of extraction. When they try to tell you that they're full of shit. Nine months plus, still spilling. Four spills on the Canadian Natural Resources Limited site on the Cold Lake Air Weapons Testing Range. 310,000 plus gallons of bitumen emulsion recovered. They've drained a lake. Beavers floating in the water dead. But, like Ariel so eloquently stated, we have <coughs> rights in Canada as treaty status. And it couldn't have been said any better than by Jack Woodward, who was a lawyer on our litigation team. He said, where there is a treaty or aboriginal right, governments cannot destroy the meaningful opportunity to exercise the right. And for a right to hunt fish or gather plant or medicine resources to be meaningful, there must remain a harvestable surplus of the species being collected. And to have a harvestable surplus, there must be a healthy, productive wild population. And to have a healthy wild population, there must be sufficient 
productive habitat to support that population. In other words, there must be a healthy natural environment, and if the natural environment is degraded by industrial activity, and the populations are stressed and put into crisis by industry, and if there is no longer a population of species healthy enough to support the right, then there has been an infringement of the right. And the First Nations rights are enshrined as Aboriginal rights in Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982. And they are arguably some of the most important emerging rights on the Canadian legal landscape and certainly the most powerful environmental rights in the country. Thus, when these mega projects are destroying the First Nations rights to hunt, trap, fish and forage, which are the indirect violation of our constitutional rights, the highest law in Canada their law, they made that law because us, we abide by natural law. And there's nothing natural about a people dying from cancer. Then there's grounds to challenge. And my uncle Ron Lehman, who's a member of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation, what he said was, we want the non-indigenous people, the developers, to prove to us that there is such a thing as sustainable development. That only way that is going to happen is if the indigenous people are consulted and given all of the information before any <coughs> development takes place. And that obviously hasn't happened. So in May of 2008, under former retired Chief Al Lehman, and now carried forth by the current leadership, the Beaver Lake Cree Nation filed a statement of claim in the Alberta Court of Queen's Bench, where we cited over 17,000 infringements on our constitutionally protected rights. Basically over 17,000 permits that were granted to big oil within the Beaver Lake Cree's traditional hunting territory. And the legal action is going for a declaration that the cumulative impact of the tar sands infringes on our inherent treaty rights and to date violations. And it's a critical case. Why? Because it would be the most powerful ecological precedent ever set in a Canadian court because it protects the entire biological system with a view to preserving its sustainable productivity. And this litigation will determine that crucial point when the system can't take it anymore. So the precedent that will be set by the Beaver Lake case is that it will be the first time the court is asked to draw the line defining when there's too much industrial development in the face of constitutionally protected rights. And that comes from um, Jack Woodward. And the reason why I do this is because of those two little ones. Because it's never okay, like my uncle Ron Lehman said about 10 years ago, it's never okay that you should ever have to pacify yourself with money and become an economic hostage in your own country, on your own land. And here we sit yet again in the face of development, just like when Sir John A. Macdonald starved the Indians to get the railway across Canada, here we are yet again, sitting there again, begging for handouts. Whilst these people sit in their fancy offices with their brass hands making decisions that have human life consequences. And as Susan Smitten, the executive director of Raven Trust says, it's not fair to rely on the poorest people in our nation to stand alone and be the voice of reason in this effort. They have the power of their treaties to protect the planet, and we have the power of a nation to support them. And I just encourage people to get behind the line. They figuratively and literally draw to the tar sand. And we are looking for your support in this lawsuit, whether it's organizing a fundraiser in your community or going online and donating to our latest projects. And I think if there's anything that I can leave you folks with, is that if these pipelines go through, your government is going to further assist in the raping and pillaging of the lands of my ancestors, whilst deliberately ignoring the basic human rights of my children. Because my children are human beings too. My children have a basic human right to drink clean water and breathe clean air. And I choose to live in my community. I choose to be there. And it's not easy waking up every single day and facing this destruction head on. And we need to all stop pretending 
with our eyes closed and our blinders on, going by day by day, pretending this is not happening, because it is. And I'm here to remind you about that, that there are people over there, and we are human beings too. And unlike people like Joe Oliver, our natural resources minister, who was said, he was quoted not directly, but this was my interpretation. Tarsan's land is uninhabitable by uh, human beings. So you know, no community is being disrupted. That land he's talking about is where I live, where my children live, where Ariel's family lives. And we're human beings too. We are there, and we are not going anywhere. I'm thankful and I'm grateful. Uh, so the Portland Montreal Pipeline is a 236 mile crude oil pipeline. Currently carries conventional crude oil from the port of South Portland up to Canada. It was built, uh, completed in 1941 in order to bring conventional crude oil up to support the Canadian World War II effort because they entered the war before we did. The pipeline built in 1941 was decommissioned a few years afterwards, but two subsequent pipelines were added to that, uh, that stretch of land. Um, including uh, one built in the 50s and one built in the 60s. And of those, one is still operational, carrying conventional crude oil through Vermont, through Maine, and through Nam uh, New Hampshire. Uh, the route of that pipeline is maintained as a clear-cut right-of-way. So it stretches 166 miles within the United States through those three states. This picture here was taken in Victory State Forest in Vermont, which is home to a number of endangered species. It also cuts through the White Mountain National Forest. The entire way is this desolate, barren strip of lands. Um, pretty impactful to see from the top of a hill like that. And all along the way where the pipeline intersects with waterways and with roadways, it's indicated with these little uh, crude oil pipeline warnings. And so if you drive through the North Country or if you travel into southern Maine or Vermont, uh, keep an eye out. You may actually see these. It crosses the road in a number of places and it runs alongside uh, a number of local routes. Uh, there's also six pumping stations along the route. And those are some of the more visible infrastructure. Here you can see some places where the pipeline comes above ground. And on the left, you can also see the Clean Harbors trailer. That is the first line of defense against a crude oil spill in the fragile habitats of the White Mountain National Forest. It's that little trailer which will respond when an 18 or 24 inch diameter pipeline begins spinning, spilling crude oil at over 90 PSI into the environment. And that will be the only thing on scene for perhaps hours as larger response efforts take place. Now, uh, you've heard me mention that this is a conventional crude oil pipeline, but we're here to talk about tar sands. Well, back in 2008, uh, as the markets continued to, to change, tar sands became a more important energy source over conventional crude oil. The Enbridge Corporation and its local affiliates, the Portland Pipeline Company and the Montreal Pipeline Company, put forward a proposal uh, to retrofit that pipeline in order to reconnect it to existing tar sands infrastructure and bring conventional, uh, bring tar sands crude from the Alberta tar sands, which we've been hearing about, uh, through New England in order to export them along the Atlantic coast via the port of South Portland. That would bring a dramatically higher risk to the pipeline and to the three states that it passes through along with the area in Canada. Um, this is a very aging pipeline. As we've heard, it's, it's uh, four or five decades old. Um, pipelines are designed to last about 30 or 40 years. This one should be in the phase of being decommissioned as opposed to being retrofitted. Uh, reversing it would cause additional stress on the pipeline. Pipelines are designed and built to flow in one direction. So the, the curves are designed to relieve pressure. The sockets are fitted to minimize the risk of a burst. Uh, retrofitting the pipeline would significantly increase the risk because it would ignore these factors. And what's more, tar sands crude, or bitumen, uh, that we've heard about is a considerably more dangerous substance to pipe. Uh, it requires high heat and pressure in order to flow, uh, which again increases the risk of a spill, and it's also a physically abrasive and corrosive substance on its own right. 
Uh, Katie's going to talk a little bit more about what it might look like if a spill were actually to take place in this area, which has been the subject of her research for the last year or so. Thank you. So we've talked a little bit about what bitumen is, and I'd just like to compare it to conventional oil. The Portland Montreal pipeline is currently piping light conventional crude oil or medium conventional crude oil, and light and medium is talking about the density of these oils. Um, bitumen uh, is something that they're looking to dilute when they're transporting it through the pipeline, but it's considered a very heavy oil, which is something that this pipeline was not created to transport. Another difference is that if and when these pipelines spill, if they spill tar sands, uh, there's a drastic difference between what it looks like with a conventional oil spill and what it looks like with bitumen. Bitumen is a dense substance. It'll sink to the bottom of water. What you see when you look at like pictures from the BP oil spill is they'll put out buoys to kind of help to contain the pipeline spill. And you can't use those with, with a bitumen spill because what they use to cut the what they use to cut the tar sand so that it's easier to flow evaporates, it disappears, it's a volatile compound, and you're left with a dense viscous substance that just comes to the bottom of a lake or a river and sits there. An example of this has been the Kalamazoo River spill in Michigan that we've talked about a little bit that happened in 2010. It's been three years since this spill happened, and the spill did not start in the river. It started an open spill, I mean an open field. It flowed into the creek and went 40 miles downstream into the Kalamazoo River. I'm sorry, it stretched the length of the Kalamazoo River of 40 miles is what we contaminated. We're at the three-year mark of this having happened, and the spill has not still fully been um, eradicated. It's suspected that between 180,000 to 280,000 gallons still remain in the river. Understanding what happened with the Kalamazoo River spill is what initiated my interest in researching the Portland-Montreal pipeline in New Hampshire. I wanted to, in, in light of, sorry, knowing that, that this pipeline was potentially going to produce, like, have tar sands within it, I wanted to look at and understand what are the risks that this will pose to communities if something like the Kalamazoo River spill was to occur. So I'm looking at the potential risk to the benefits and the quality of life of communities that live along this river as it pertains, I'm sorry, along this pipeline as it pertains to rivers and waterways and wetlands. I've done the New Hampshire portion of this research through the National Science Foundation and New Hampshire EPSCOR, and I identified 80 streams and rivers that are crossed in New Hampshire. This is just the New Hampshire portion. Um, one of the, the biggest discoveries that I made in doing this research was that the pipeline flows primarily through floodplains. When you're talking about the 1950s and the 1960s, I would assume they didn't want to go over the large White Mountain range. They didn't want to go over the White Mountains. They, didn't, they wanted to do the easiest flow path, so they chose along streams and rivers and low elevation. Unfortunately, when you choose low elevation, you're also choosing where streams like to go. On this, you can see the Connecticut River, the Israel River. You've got the Moose River. Uh, Peabody River is also included, and then the Androscoggin is the orange on this side. Uh, one of the largest concerns that I identified was the fact that a spill starting in Randolph from here over has the potential to reach the Connecticut River, which flows not just through New Hampshire, but in Vermont as well, and down into Connecticut. Anywhere from over here, it has the potential to go into the Androscoggin River. And if I was to, which I'm planning to, expand this research to Maine and Vermont, you would see a lot more rivers and a lot more waterways that are at risk. The reason why I focused on these waterways to look was to look at things such as property value, clean drinking water, tourism, and recreation that's at risk for the communities that live in this area. And Brett will talk a little bit more about that when he discusses um, some of the stories that we heard from people who live along this pipeline. So, uh, Katie has been working hard on this research for a couple semesters now, but she told us that she felt like she was spending a lot of time staring at a computer screen, and we live in this really beautiful area, so for her, um, part of the importance of this project was to get a chance to experience those ecosystems firsthand. And when I heard her starting to describe this project, 
the idea of traversing the pipeline, sharing her research with the people that are affected by it, I thought it was a really great idea. But I also thought it was only half of the equation. And the reason that I thought that was that, you know, I grew up here in the state, we go camping in the White Mountains every year. I like to think of myself as fairly well informed, but I had no idea that there was a crude oil pipeline pumping through the state. Uh, and I thought that there might be other people like me that weren't aware of this issue, what, but were in a position to become engaged around it. So uh, I asked Kate if I could tag along on the project with her. And uh, while she shared her research with the people that we met, I wanted to hear their stories, hear about how this issue affected them, uh, and get their thoughts. Um, so I wanted to share a couple of the things that we learned with you all. Uh, what we're looking at here is the town bridge in Coventry, Vermont. This is near where we started our project, where the pipeline crosses the Canadian border. Um, the reason that this bridge is significant is that the pipeline, uh, the Portland Montreal pipeline, uh, has spilled before. It spilled in 1952, it released a few thousand gallons of crude oil uh, into this river here. And citizens in town noticed the spill, uh, realized that the spill had occurred when they saw <coughs> oily water flowing underneath the bridge. Um, from there, we drove a few miles to uh, Roaring Brook in Barton, Vermont. And this is an important brook to look at for a couple reasons. Uh, the first is that uh, earlier this spring, this is a site of a pipeline washout. This means that the water picked up and it revealed the pipelines. Well, this is obviously a huge problem because if the water were to rise again and start rolling boulders down the waterway, or if a tree <coughs> were to go through, that's how a pipeline break happens. So for us, it was really significant to stand at the spot and look at it and see how close we can come uh, all across the state to a pipeline break. Uh, it really is not a matter of, of when it will happen, or of if it will happen, but when and where. Uh, and to stand at this site, we really did get a sense of that firsthand. The second reason that brook is important is that uh, it's very close to Crystal Lake in Barton, Vermont, which is a glacial lake. It's a really important site for the community. There's a ton of fishing and camping and hiking all around that lake. Um, and I think that this, this really demonstrates Katie's point, that this pipeline really does traverse through some of the worst areas that you could possibly imagine putting a pipeline. So after spending some time in Vermont and speaking with some people there, we headed over to New Hampshire. Uh, one of the stops that we made in Jefferson was a place called Santa's Village, which is my first visit there. I was a Storyland kid, but uh, Katie was a kid, not to say here, but Katie was a, 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 a Santa's Village, uh, I guess, person. So um, <laughs> pipeline, pipeline passes through Jefferson, where Santa's Village is located, and it passes right behind the reindeer enclosure. They have uh, 27 reindeer there, and one of the only successful reindeer breeding programs <coughs> in America. Uh, and the pipeline goes about 100 feet by the enclosure. Um, the reindeer were a little skittish at first, but we discovered that if you sing Christmas carols to them, they get a little bit more familiarized with things. <laughs> not quite so afraid to come up and say hello. So we sat down with one of the owners of Santa's Village. This is a third generation family business. It was opened by the, the gentleman's um, wife's grandparents. Uh, there are really important members of the community. Jefferson is a fairly economically depressed part of our state, uh, and they are one of the largest seasonal employers, providing 300 jobs for local high school students or people who need some temporary work. Uh, and we asked the guy about the pipeline, and he said, yeah, we know it's there, but at the same time, we, we don't really know it's there. We don't think about it. We don't think about the risk. It's something that we take for granted, like many of us take for granted the uh, fossil fuel infrastructure that exists around us. We told him about the tar sands proposal, uh, and it was the first he had heard of it. And he thought about it for a little while, he asked us a few really great questions, and then he said, if they're gonna go ahead with this, or if they're gonna consider this, uh, my hope is that they would take all the business owners along the route and all the property owners and they bring us to the table. They talk to us, they tell us the risks, they give us a chance to voice our concerns. And for a lot of people, people like this gentleman that feel that the pipeline has been a good neighbor, uh, all they want is just a chance to share their voice. Uh, the third business that uh, we spoke with uh, over in Maine was a, a gentleman named Seabury Lyons. Uh, and he retired to Maine a few years ago after a long career as a safety engineer for IBM at a superconductor plant. So for his whole career, for uh, three decades, he worked with the types of volatile and toxic chemicals that would be used in tar sands in order to dilute it and allow it to flow. He understands risk. He spent his life thinking about risk. Uh, since retiring, he's opened a business called Bethel Outdoor Adventures and Maine Mineralogy Expeditions. It's right on the Androscoggin River in downtown Bethel. They do kayaking, canoeing, camping right along the river. Uh, the river for him is his economic livelihood. It's a way of supporting himself and his wife in retirement. And he said, if this pipeline spills, I am instantaneously out of business. And instantaneously out of business because no one is going to want to come to the Androscoggin River if it's full of bitumen. 
And that's true, he's not just out of business for a few weeks or a few months, he's out of business for a few years. Because as Katie said, when bitumen spills, it sinks to the bottom of waterways, rolls along the bottom, and it requires them to be dredged. Can you imagine dredging through a, a waterway in this area, like the Lamper River, how devastating that'd be to the communities here? Uh, Seabury has been trying to insure against this risk. He's been trying to protect uh, what he's built, uh, and you can't find a company that's willing to take the bad days. It's not a good bet. I think that tells you a little bit about the risk that we're all facing now. The next stop that we went to was Sebago Lake. Um, what we have is a picture of the Portland Montreal pipeline crossing Jordan Bay, which feeds right into Sebago Lake. It's actually the upper hand corner that you see, and it flushes in. Um, Sebago Lake was one of the places that uh, people have been primarily concerned about because while the pipeline goes right across it, it's also within the watershed that feeds into Sebago Lake. So like with what happened at the Kalamazoo River spill, it could happen in an open field and still end up contaminating this lake. Sebago Lake is important because it is the drinking water to of 15 to 25 percent of the entire state of Maine. Um, it's also extremely crucial for recreation and tourism, and uh, it's also extremely crucial for property value. If there was to be a tar sand spill here, it would be devastating towards drinking water. It could also be devastating towards property value and tourism. And tourism is one of the number one sources of income for, well, freshwater tourism is one of the number one sources of income for any of the states uh, that has this pipeline running through it. So we entered our traverse in South Portland, which is the heart of the tar sands battle in the Northeast right now. I had a chance to share our story with some of the local media, along with some of the organizers that have been leading this fight in tar sands, uh, against tar sands. Uh, the tar sands pipeline, the, the whole length that we were visiting, is buried underground, so we didn't see much of it. But in South Portland, the tar sands, in, or rather, the pipeline, uh, the pipeline infrastructure is much more visible. Part of the reason is, a, is that there is a few dozen crude oil holding tanks throughout the city of Portland. Uh, there you can see a field of the tanks and the circled area at the bottom is the high school. Uh, to give you a sense of the size of the tanks, you can see one of the tanks there and in the background there's a person's house. Uh, part of the reason that these tanks are an important issue is that as you've heard, uh, tar uh, bitumen is diluted with a number of substances. Um, Conventional crude oil on its own, while flammable, is not volatile or explosive. Uh, the tar sands crew that would, be, would, that would be put through this pipeline due to those uh, additives, like natural gas, is. Uh, it poses a significantly, significantly greater risk for the communities. Uh, when the proposal to pump tar sands through this pipeline was first put forward in 2008, um, a local fight began to make sure that they didn't pass through the town. Uh, back in November, the culmination of a campaign to protect uh, South Portland. Um, uh, the campaign culminated with a, a vote on a ballot in November. Uh, it was for the Waterfront Protection Ordinance, to effectively prevent the company from developing infrastructure on the waterfront that would be required to pump tar sands the opposite direction. Uh, unfortunately, that ballot measure failed. Many of the people that voted on it voiced the concern that although they were opposed to tar sands, they felt that uh, th there could be an undue risk to other businesses uh, in the area. Uh, what's more, uh, opposition, they were outspent four to one on the campaign. Um, luckily, the city council heard these concerns and they passed a temporary moratorium on the uh, export of tar sands through South, the port of South Portland. Uh, while the moratorium is in place, they're developing a permanent ordinance. So, the very, very last stop of our trip was really where it all began. The woman second from the left is named Rachel. She was one of the leaders of the Protect South Portland fight. She immigrated to the United States in 1966. Um, has been living here in the United States since then. Uh, but she didn't bother becoming a citizen until this year. The reason she did so is that she wanted to cast her first ever vote, and she wanted that vote to be the first person to vote for the Waterfront Protection Ordinance, which she was. Uh, the reason I think it's a good slide to leave up here is that these are the, the living rooms where these conversations need to be taking place. Um, you know, there are plenty of people like me who could be opposed to this project if we were aware of it. Uh, so it's up to all of us to have these conversations in our living rooms, uh, on our social media pages, uh, in, the, in the press, uh, about the risk that these projects pose to our communities. And it's important that we keep an eye, uh, keep a very close eye on what these companies are attempting to do right up our noses. I'd just like to end by thanking everyone for coming here and making yourself aware of this issue. 
Um, I'm ending with this map because it shows that this is not only a fight that's happening in our backyard, but it's something that's going on in Alberta, Canada, and that we should all be aware when we're choosing to act or be inactive on this issue of the risks that this is posing to the people who live in Alberta, Canada, as well as the people who are living here. Thank you very much.